Hi, it's Cindy Wabi, and I am here to share a little bit of information about the glass fishing float. I got a request from someone if I would do a little tutorial on it. So here I am, and I'm, I'm here with my little uh, rescue pooch, Bella, who has taken up residence in my office today. And there she is, she's made her appearance. So um, I know a little bit about floats because I've collected them for years. I, I got my first float when I was about six years old when we made our first trip to the Oregon coast and we went to the, um, the undersea gardens in Newport. And my parents bought both my brother and I a little float to bring home and I still have that today 50 years later. And, and uh, I've always had an interest in them and collected them for years. And I'll tell you about this one in just a little bit. Uh, this is a true Japanese glass float, an authentic float, and I'm holding it back so that you can kind of get a sense of the size. I know it's Japanese for two reasons. One is the color and also because of the marking. The Japanese started making these floats in about 1910 and they made them using recycled glass, any kind of glass, cheap glass that they could get their hands on. And the glass that was most readily available to them were old sake bottles. And this is the color of those old bottles and uh, that's what they would, uh, would use to make these. And if you look closely at these, you'll see lots of little bubbles and imperfections and weightiness in the glass. And that comes from the cheap glass that they used, uh, the fact that it was dirty, and they melted it down fast and blew it. So I think uh, all those imperfections make for a really perfect ball. And, and the more that's in there, the more that I like. Every float has one of these right here. And this is the sealing button that went on the blowhole. And so just like, just like every human has a belly button, every float has a, a sealing button for the blowhole. Some floats also have a second button. Let me see if I can find, mine is right here. I'm gonna see if I can hold this so that you can see that. Can you see that right there? If you were here in person, and maybe you can pick it up just a little bit, you'll see there's some markings on that sealing button right there. Not all floats, as I said, have that secondary button, but when they are there, you wanna look and see if you can see the mark on them. And that mark is put there by the blower, and it will indicate either their own personal trademark or the trademark of the company that uh, they worked for, and sometimes even the village. And people who collect these floats, one of the things that they love to do is do the research and find out, um, when they look at those marks, find out where their floats have come from. The Japanese did not invent glass blowing. It was actually invented by a Norwegian fisherman in the 1840s, and he kind of perfected the process. They picked it up after the turn of the century and produced the bulk of these floats and um, over the years, those other countries got on board as well, Korea, China, um, and Thailand also produced them. But we, we see the, most of what we see are from Japan, and the Japanese fishermen were the, the greatest users of these as well. They stopped producing these floats in the 1940s. They're fragile, they broke a lot, they broke free, and so the fishermen started using um, a wooden float uh, around the mid-century there and then um, more recently what we see in use today are either wood floats, plastic or styrofoam floats. Um, I think that these are just uh, fabulous works of art. I love, I love the different sizes and shapes. They come in different colors also. Um, you can all, sometimes find them that are shaped like little rolling pins or two balls pressed together. That's always uh, interesting, but this right here is kind of the granddaddy float of all time. And uh, my float was um, taken off the beach in uh, the 19, probably around 1964, whenever the, the great Columbus Day storm was here on the Oregon coast, if you know your coastal history. Um, there was a local school teacher who went out on the beach the following morning with his pickup truck and a friend and they collected over 400 of these floats after the Columbus Day storm. And I was very fortunate about 15 years ago to be able to buy what was left of that collection from his children and I have sold them over the years and this is one that I kept for myself because it's just such a beautiful specimen. Uh, these floats are fragile. The, the safest place for a glass float is in the water 
And so when you take them out of the water, you do want to be careful. Uh, and when I've had them displayed in my store over the years, what I've done is I've gone down to the, the um, hardware store and had them cut pieces of a uh, three or four inch round PVC pipe for me and I had them make them in maybe four inch high um, different um, heights and then I would display those that way. Uh, at home, I like to put these in my garden and use them in a place of a gazing ball and that's kind of fun to have them out in the yard and have moss or ivy growing up around them. You can still find these. They're not uh, as, as prolific as they were in the 70s and 80s, uh, but they are still out there. They're floating out in the Pacific Ocean. They're kind of caught up in a circular wave pattern. They're also still on the ocean floor, and sometimes when there's an earthquake or activity down on the ocean floor, it'll, it'll force them up to the surface, and then they'll get caught in that circular pattern in the deep Pacific. And it takes a really good storm to break them free out of that pattern and then we will see them come up on our beaches, primarily California, Oregon, Washington. Um, once in a while they will float onto the beaches in Alaska. It takes about eight years for a float to travel uh, on the ocean from Oregon up into Alaska. I think that's kind of a fascinating thing. Best time to find these is either in the middle of a really blustery storm or, or right afterwards when the tide has receded and you, it's, it's safe to go out on the beaches. You want to look uh, around where all the wood pilings are, driftwood, seaweed, grasses that kind of are clump up on the beaches. These get caught up in that. Most of what you're going to find are the small ones, um, four inches or smaller, but once in a while you get to find uh, a treasure. My husband um, who's been here on the Oregon coast for 40, 50 years, has, tells me stories about going out in the 70s and 80s and coming home with several floats from uh, a beach trip after the storm. I've never been fortunate enough to find one myself, but I've handled hundreds of them in my shop, and I've, I find them a fascinating thing and, a, and um, just kind of a fun part of doing business in a coastal town. So hope that's informative and helpful for you and, and you uh, find it as interesting as I do. Thanks for watching my video. Bella says thanks also and thanks for sharing my video when you can. Have a great day. Take care. Bye.